Good morning, everyone, uh, and welcome to this sunrise uh, breakfast session on nociception monitoring. Uh, I am Frank Overdyke. I'm an anesthesiologist and serve as consultant medical director uh, for Medicense, an Israeli company that developed the nociception level monitor. Uh, hopefully everybody has their coffee and their croissant and or your bagel if you're from New York or if you're a chicken biscuit if you're from South Carolina. So um, we are lucky enough to have two prominent professors of anesthesia with us this morning to help us discuss the need for nociception monitoring uh, and the exper their experience with this technology. So let me just share my screen. There we go, we can still see everybody. Um, so we have Dr. TJ Gann, uh, who needs no introduction. Dr. Gann is probably the American godfather of ERAS, early recovery after surgery. After Dr. Henrik Kellett in Denmark uh, introduced the concept, Dr. Gann became an early adopter and published extensively on ERAS. Uh, Dr. Gann is the founding president of the American Society of Enhanced Recovery, which is sort of the second act of ERAS. Dr. Gann is a professor of, uh, and endowed chair of anesthesiology at Stony Brook School of Medicine. Uh, he's not with us this morning because uh, he's up, up already and Adam is doing another, chairing another meeting, but we've re pre recorded his session and we'll be playing that later. Uh, Dr. Kurt Reutzler is an associate, associate professor of anesthesiology at the Cleveland Clinic. And he is with us live and in person. And he got his medical anesthesia training in one of the most beautiful cities in the world, in Vienna. And that's because he's lucky enough to be Austrian. So uh, Dr. Reutzler's research interests and publications are centered around blood pressure, intraoperative blood pressure, and outcomes related to blood pressure deviations. And as such, his interest logically extends to nociception uh, because uh, inadequate pain treatment in the OR obviously leads to hypotension or hypertension. He and Dr. Gann are both using null currently to evaluate the impact of null guidance opioid dosing in on packing pain, which is the primary endpoint, and as a secondary endpoint on things like hemodynamic stability, stress response, uh, and uh, the secondary inputs such as those. So this morning we're gonna, uh, this is our agenda. We're gonna start with some background on nociception monitoring and a technical description of the null monitor, as well as talk about a couple of outcome studies uh, that we can share with you. Then Dr. Reutzler will give us a few slides with his perspective on nociception monitoring, followed by Dr. Gann's slides and my recorded conversation with him. These pre uh, presentations will be followed by 15 minutes of Q&A. Uh, if you have any questions in the presentations, please include them in the chat room and we'll do our best to address them and answer them. If we're unable to respond, we'll get back to you in person uh, through another means. You'll also be able to find a link in the chat room to access some unique clinical insights relating to nociception monitoring. Uh, so go ahead and click, click and get through there. The material will help you uh, with some uh, more clarification on the technology. So let me start off. Um, we are taught uh, that our job is to take care of three domains of gen in, during general anesthesia, namely analgesia, muscle relaxation, and hypnosis. And the first domain to, uh, to get an objective monitor was muscle relaxation. In the 1970s, Hassan Ali at the Mass General developed the train of four monitor. It's an objective measure of neuromuscular blockade and is extremely important still in 2020 in evaluating residual motor blockade in the PACU. Then in the 1990s, we got hypnosis or depth of anesthesia monitors. So they show you the BIS monitor here. There's also other monitors available, but the BIS is one that I'm familiar, most familiar with. And as reluctant as I was to accept that I needed a depth of anesthesia monitor, I've really come to depend on the BIS for a number of cases. Perhaps not for every case, but certainly for a number of special cases where my depth of anesthesia may be in question depending on the case in the surgery. 
But the domain that remains a challenge for us is to objectively titrate analgesia and opioids specifically. If you're like me, you said, well, I'm pretty good at dosing opioids. You know, I've been doing it for a long time. It, it's like salt. We sprinkle in a little here and there to taste. But to be honest, we don't quite get it right all the time. And our patients have pain in the PACU, especially those uh, like opioid tolerant patients, sometimes very difficult to dose, or the elderly who are reluctant to give many opioids. So we could really use with an, uh, an objective monitor of pain uh, to help us with these titrations. So let's start with a, a little de some definitions. Uh, pain is an unpleasant sensory and emotional experience associated with potential tissue damage. So notice the words unpleasant, um, emotional, and potential. So that's not physiology, that's psychology. And that's why pain is something you cannot, uh, you cannot measure in an anesthetized patient's that you have to be an awake patient, and it's, it's a subjective um, measure. Nociception, however, is the process that encodes a noxious stimuli from peripheral uh, neurons. So nociception and pain are different, that you can't confuse one with the other. I sort of consider them as a pain, as a Venn diagram. Not all pain is nociception, and not all nociception is pain. For instance, People have pain and physiologic parameters of pain, heart, heart rate and blood pressure changes when they have emotional stress, losing a loved one. So they have pain, uh, but not necessarily no susception. The people who walk on hot coals, they have no susception. They have a lot of, of their sensory fibers fi firing, but they may not experience pain. So they're sort of different uh, items. So this is a good... Uh, way uh, to look at why we need some help with pain dosing. There's about a 20 to 30 fold variability in opioid plasma levels and effect uh, as we give the same dose of opioids. So a huge interpatient variability. And if I give everybody in this conference uh, 10 milligrams of morphine, we're gonna have a, some people are gonna be very sedated. Some people are gonna hardly say, what did, you, what did you give me? Did you give me anything? Milligram per kilo dosing, it's, uh, we call that personalization. It's really not, it's primitive, it's archaic. It's really something of the past. It doesn't work too well. And of course there is synergy between hypnosis and analgesia as well, as you can see on this curve here. Um, opioids can have a sparing effect on hypnotics and vice versa. So uh, hypnotics have a sparing effect on opioids. But notice that you, we can't obtain full hypnosis with only opioids. Uh, but that we can obtain full uh, analgesia with only hypnotic. So, so this is where we have these, these asymptotes. We are always trying to hit this sweet spot right here, the optimal interaction. Opioid tolerance is another reason is more prevalent. And so dosing opioids can be more challenging. I got to minimize this because we're looking at too many things here. Uh, why objective nociception monitoring matters? We want to try and get this balance right between underuses of opioids and excessive use. And both of those have downsides, uh, as you can see. Um, I don't need to, to spend too much time on exactly what those are, but you can see uh, the underuse gives severe postoperative pain, sensitization uh, may cause chronic pain uh, postoperatively, and excessive use, we know what all the side effects are. Uh, opioid-induced hyperalgesia, respiratory depression, and, and the less, the more annoying side effects such as post-operative nausea and vomiting. Uh, so uh, bad opioid management is bad for patients and bad for efficiency. Now let's look at uh, what the nociception and pain, they affect the sympathetic nervous system, a fight or flight response. And these are the kind of things that happen uh, when we have nociception and pain, pupils dilate, breathing and heart rate picks up, blood vessels constrict, sweating occurs, and many of the parasympathetic functions of the, of, such as the bile motility and digestive enzyme secretion turning down. So null captures several of these signals. That's, let me show you exactly what we're capturing in the null monitor. These are the signals that give us a measure of sympathetic activated organ systems. The transducer looks like a bulky pulse oximeter, it measures four signals, the photopleth, and its amplitude specifically, it measures galvanic skin response, 
uh, which is a fancy way of saying it uh, measures uh, skin conductance, it changes as the body sweats. From these signals, it derives dozens of parameters, such as heart rate and heart variability, which go into the calculation of null. It also measures temperature and movement, but these are not involved in the der derivation of nociception. So what, what does this null metric actually do? A clinical study was done with 25 patients having general anesthesia with fentanyl and remifentanil as the analgesics in various types of surgery. And so that probe measured skin conductance, heart rate, plethora amplitude, heart rate variability, et cetera, and put those into a black box, into an a, a algorithm. And out came the CESA, the combined in index of stimulation and analgesia, which is essentially a measure of the stimulation intensity, such as incision, minus what the PKPD calculation of the, of the analgesic was. And so what was done here, a rock curve was, was composed for each of these metrics, as well as the combination, which is the null, the null takes all of them, to see how well uh, we could, the, the algorithm could differentiate a noxious stimulus from a non-noxious stimulus. Noxious stimuli being intubation, being incision, a less noxious stimuli or no noxious stimuli being prep and drape, bringing emergence, things like that. And somewhere in between falls Foley catheter placement, things like that. And what you see here on this, uh, on the rock curve, is that all the parameters didn't, they didn't perform great. Um, skin conductance alone, pleth amplitude, a heart rate, heart, heart rate, heart rate variability did pretty well. As you know, there are some uh, monitors out there that measure heart rate variability as an indirect measure of nociception. But the ones that did best were this combination, so this black box. So there's an algorithm that MetaSense has that's in, in the monitor that takes these inputs, uh, does some fancy stuff with it, which I'll show you in a minute, and then generates the output, which is the null index from zero to 100, tells us how much nociception there is. And as you can see on the rock curve, area on the curve is pretty good, it's pretty high, 0 0.97 uh, for the null nonlinear one, and 0.96. So what is that algorithm? So it's a deep learning algorithm uh, uh, called a random forest. It's called, a, and otherwise it's a type of supervised classification algorithm. And so during those surgeries in those patients, what we had is we had bunches of sets of those four inputs, vital signs. Let me give you an example. We'll have a heart rate that was less than 95 and a pulse amplitude that was less than 0.5. And this is a simple uh, example. I'm only using two metrics, but remember we have derivatives of each of those. And then there was a CESA was calculated and it corresponded to mild pain. So now we're teaching the algorithm that was a combination of mild pain. There was an other, during incision perhaps, the heart rate was greater than 95 and the skin conductance was uh, greater than 20, and this co corresponded with severe pain. So we have all these data sets, these uh, data sets in time, and what's called, we generate a forest, or each constitutes a tree, and all these data sets teach the algorithm what is pain, what is no pain, what is mild pain, what is severe pain. So that's a random forest algorithm. And what's very cool about this, and we'll go back one, uh, is that, what the monitor does when you first start with the patient, it measures these parameters and generates a baseline, sort of a calibration for that patient. Then as the surgery proceeds, instead of going back and, and comparing to this library of indices, it goes and uses the patient's own responses to those stimuli as, so it, it's sort of a personalization of that score. And that's why this uh, technology is, I think, uh, so uh, revolutionary. The null trend, as I mentioned, is a number between zero and 100. And here you see one of these tracings. If the trend, the threshold for adequate nociception is 25, here you see, uh, it's carrying, getting carried away from me. Null trend above 25 is bad news. You probably want to add to your analgesic at this point. You see that period that might have been intubation. We've already given some fentanyl probably at the beginning and that's where you, where you uh, give that. And you see that in the middle of the case, you give some more. 
If it goes below 10, you really have no, no susception level uh, to speak of. So the, the patient is very well analgesed, perhaps maybe too well analgesed. If you're running a remifentanil drip, you might wanna turn that down a little bit. So the, the, real, the target is between 0 to 25, really between 10 and 25. But uh, you get a sense of how you can kind of, that, that area to the right of the curve here is, is perfect, is ideal. So what's the clinical value in the operating theater? Uh, you can look at these boxes in detail. We think will be a smoother perioperative anesthetic management, uh, safer titration of analgesic with high-risk patients, such as the elderly or the uh, opioid-tolerant patients, Improved postoperative outcomes, that's clearly someone, uh, something that people are very interested in to, val to justify the purchase of a monitor, an additional monitor. Confirming effectiveness of regional blocks. Remember, you can use this. We use the clamp test in OB to see if our, C if our spinal is working. You hear you could get a very nice uh, uh, working regional block confirmed with the null versus a non-regional uh, working regional block. And then there's, you can validate multimodal analgesia regimens as well. A couple of papers real quick to tell you about uh, the clinical evidence, the impact of this, the reduction in pain scores is on, on average, this is the solar study from uh, Professor Dahan in Leiden, the Holland, reduction in pain scores is about 33% and a 50% reduction in stress hormones. But the pain scores is really, are really interesting. I want you to look at what, what happened here. Uh, here we have the standard of care group. And here we have the pain, the PACU pain scores in the null guided group. As you know, in most PACUs, they have a tiered dosing uh, scheme uh, orders. So if the pain is below four, patients get no pain medicine between four and seven. They get some pain medicine if it's greater than seven it's they get a lot of pain medicines, let's say. And so this is significant because this moved, monitoring uh, the case intraoperatively and dosing your fentanyl with null moved a lot of these patients in terms of PACU pain from, from this area where we typically give some opioids, dilaudid or morphine into the no treatment. So now we have a significant shift in this and that means all the things that go along with this, fewer, mild side effects, nausea, vomiting, moderate side effects, or even severe side effects, that may, is, is a real clinical value. 84% of the null patients had a post-operative pain score of four or less versus 40% in the standard of care. So that's really, I think, quite a significant uh, decrease. You may say a, a, de a median pain score from 4.8 to 3.2 is not that much, but it does have an impact uh, when you have a, uh, a, a, a decrease in whether you in the intervention whether you treat or not so um that is still more than a 30 percent. that's about a 30 percent decrease 33 percent decrease the other thing that's interesting be uh most interesting dr reutzler of course is hemodynamic stability uh the study showed 80 percent reduction in hypotensive events and 30 percent reduction in remifentanil use and this is with remifentanil so this is not a fentanyl study and uh, that's clearly significant, a significant hypotension is a bad thing. We have a lot of data from Dr. Sester and his team at the Cleveland Clinic that say hypotension is a really bad thing and we need to avoid it at all costs. 